<laughs> you know, Simon, this book published by Penguin Viking is promoted the untold story of the most daring escape of the Pacific War mm. during World War II. It must be some story. Good evening to author Tom Trumbull. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, you have some personal connection with the book, don't you? I do indeed. The, uh, the protagonist of the book was my grandfather, a man by the name of Brian Rofe who um, was an extraordinary man. He died exactly nine years to the day before I was born, but I grew up um, having a pretty strong sense of the man. He was a man of staggering high achievement. He put Australia's first satellite into outer space. He oh. was the director of Australia's Antarctic Division. He was the foremost expert in aerospace science and tropical meteorology, good friends with Neil Armstrong, among a whole lot of other amazing people. But the thing that I was always told as a, as a kid growing up was that the event that really defined his life was the event that's recorded in my book, Rescue 2100 Hours. Before we get to that, that's an unusual name. Was he related to the DJ Stanrove? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would have been uh, fascinating had he been. You know, it would have been another link for us, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, it's a fairly uncommon name, so perhaps, um, perhaps he, he was. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, quite amazing achievements. Did he achieve all this at quite a young age? Uh, well, it sort of happened to him very quickly after the war. He was only 24 years of age when, when um, the events that, that happened in this book, recorded in this book, transpired in 1942. And then after the war, he was recruited into the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and then it was just a, a, a sort of a, a, an upward trajectory. He, he was recruited into a defence laboratory called Weapons Research Establishment. Um, I mean, I gave you the abridged version of his professional life. He was yeah. also present at the... Um, the, the uh, test of the atomic bomb at Maralinga. In fact, oh. he was um, one of the people that was put in the back of a RAF aircraft that threw, flew through the mushroom cloud, um, collecting samples, which my family now attributes to uh, his untimely demise at the age of 53 mm. uh, in 1971. Um, and, you know, considering that he died at the age of 53, it's pretty staggering all that he achieved in, in his short life. Yeah, and, and you said he and Neil Armstrong became mates. Yeah, um, that's perhaps a slight exaggeration, uh, but he, he met Neil Armstrong in 1970 uh, in Leningrad at the height of the Cold War, mm. um, and Brian, my grandfather, was sent over there as the Australian delegate to that particular conference, international um, space conference called COSPA, um, and among the dignitaries that were there was Neil Armstrong, um, and yeah, they, they struck up a friendship on that conference and, and remained in touch um, only for 12 months after that, because within 12 months yeah. my grandfather had died. Well, speaking of Maralinga, surely even in those days they were aware of the, the effects of uh, radioactivity, weren't they? Yeah, well, that's, that's right. I mean, I, I find it sort of staggering that my grandfather, who was, was really an eminent scientist and a, a man of, of fierce intellect, um, hadn't realised the risks that he was taking himself into. But he was... He was a he was a no nonsense sort of man. Well, that's, that's the impression that I had, and I think he would have mm. just sort of said, "Let's just get on with it and, yes. and do what needs to be done." But it, yes, it does seem extraordinary given what we know now and and what I assume they knew then about radio. radio. Yes, I mean, there's a story in itself on on uh, on him, isn't there? Apart from the rescue you're about to tell us about, uh, Brian's life story alone would be a fascinating read. Right? Indeed, it would. And, um, yeah, as I said, I've only given you a bridge mm. version of it. I mean, when he went and wintered down in Antarctica over 19, the winter of um, 1970, uh, you know, that in itself was, a, was an extraordinary story. Yeah, well, OK, let's go back to uh, Japanese-occupied Timor and, and start at the beginning, if you will. Yes, yeah, so, so this book is just about the, the, his wartime life, is it? It is indeed. Um, it's about essentially a group of Australian airmen who... Uh, were trapped on Timor for a period of 58 days in the early stages of the Pacific War, so in uh, February, March, April 1942. And this particular group of airmen had been charged with the responsibility of keeping operational an aerodrome in Dutch West Timor, an aerodrome called Penfui, which was about six miles east of the capital of Dutch Timor, Kupang. Um, and they were charged with the responsibility of keeping that aerodrome operational until uh, February 20 ahead of an expected uh, Japanese invasion which would transpire on the morning of February 20. Um, and plans have been put in place to effect a, a, an evacuation of this group the night before on February 19, but nobody had anticipated, obviously, the devastating bombing raids that would be carried out on Darwin on that morning. Um, and as a consequence of that, or among many things that happened in that bombing raid, um, the aircraft that were designated to collect the group were destroyed 
And uh, so my grandfather, who was the man at that stage, a flight lieutenant in the Royal Australian Air Force and a meteorological officer who'd been placed in command of this group, um, Flight Lieutenant Rofe, my grandfather, really made the, the only decision that he could in the circumstances. And during the invasion, he took his men off the aerodrome uh, and into the mountainous of in interior of Timor, um, where it was hoped that he could arrange a rescue by flying boat uh, with a 400-pound radio transceiver that he and his men had salvaged from the aerodrome. And as it happened, they did make contact with Darwin and they did arrange that rescue by flying boat. And the date that they designated for the rescue was March the 3rd, 1942, about a week and a bit after the invasion of Timor. And they, fe they rendezvoused at a little... Uh, well, the plan was to rendezvous at a village on the northwest coast called Capsali. Um, but on the morning of March the 3rd, 1942, the aircraft that had been designated to effect the rescue, uh, an enormous Empire flying boat, was destroyed in the raid on Broome. Mm. And so it really begins a, a, an epic story of, of survival against the odds. All of these men would get malaria, dysentery, dengue fever, jungle rot. They only had a very limited amount of food, about a sack full of food and, and a handful of medical supplies. So as a consequence of that, they got terribly sick. Four of them would die, three of illness, one would be bitten by a snake. And when all hope was lost, when a, when a patrol of 300 Japanese paratroopers was dispatched to their position uh, to hunt them down after their position was betrayed to the Japanese um, by Timorese who were loyal to the Japanese occupiers, when all hope was lost, uh, they received the most unlikely message of all, which was a, a message that had been patched through from an American submarine, the USS Sea Raven, which had been patrolling off the northwest coast of Timor, saying that they were on their way to, to try and effect a, a, a rescue. And I say on the cover of the book, as you said in the introduction, it's the untold story of the most daring escape of the Pacific War, and which is an enormous call. But if the most daring is the least likely to succeed, then I think that this one qualifies. Yeah, now, how many had survived at that stage? Well, of the original group of 29, uh, there were four dead. Mm. Um, so 25 of the original group, but they picked up another six people along the way, other displaced servicemen. Mm. Uh, I just want to go back to something you said more or less at the start, Tom. How did the Allies predict the actual date of the invasion of Timor by the Japanese? Well, the rec this was reconnaissance aircraft that had been sent out on the morning of February 18, 1942, from oh. Timor, mm. and had spotted uh, an enormous task force, Japanese task force, steaming towards Timor um, from the Salibs, which is, a, is an island group up in the, in the mm -hmm. north. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, the, the invasion was, was not unexpected because Timor, um, up to that point, had been subjected for the previous four weeks to strafing from Japanese zeros uh -huh. and repeated bombing runs, so mm. it, was, it, was, it was an expected invasion. How did the rescue, uh, how was that uh, affected? Because, you know, you're talking about a submarine and, and suddenly there are these guys to be rescued off, off the land. Well, that was really perhaps the most complicated element of, 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 the, of the story, what really makes it the most daring escape, I think. The, the rendezvous point to begin with was only 25 miles north of a very strong uh, Japanese base which had no less than 15 Japanese warships in its bay. Um, the air above the rendezvous point was absolutely covered in reconnaissance, Japanese reconnaissance aircraft, um, the Japanese having been made aware of this group of Australian airmen hiding out in the jungles on the northwest coast. And there was also this, th this, this patrol of 300 Japanese paratroopers on the ground searching for them. The rescue, um, because of that, had to be carried out at night under cover of darkness. So the submarine surfaced off the northwest coast and uh, a wherry, a 15-foot wooden boat, which was contained inside the superstructure of the submarine, was launched over the side. And three very brave submariners volunteered to row that boat ashore, or at least the plan was to row it ashore, collect the airmen and then row it back out to the submarine. The problem, however, was that the surf was running at 16 feet and as a consequence of that, uh, a bloke by the name of Ensign George Carlton Cook, who took command of that, that little wooden boat, um, decided that the only way that they could get the boat, they couldn't get the boat in safely without risking it being capsized. So he uh, lowered anchor out just beyond the surf line, took off his shirt, attached a long line to his wrist, uh, with, and planned to swim ashore and link up with the airmen and use that long line for them to pull themselves to the boat. Wow. But just before Cook jumped in, he noticed something shift in his peripheral vision on the surface of the water. So he dug into the bowels of the boat where there was a light and he shone it directly into the water. 
and passing in underneath that boat were no less than five, six metre long sharks. Oh. And what he did next was quite extraordinary in an exhibition of real gallantry. He jumped in and swam ashore, uh, and, you know, in, in through waters that were absolutely choked with, with, with sharks mm. or shark infested. Yeah, right. And that was the first of eight swims that he would do between oh. the boat and, uh, and the beach. Uh, where he linked up with the airmen. What boat. a hero. And so was Brian Rope in radio contact with the submarine, was he? He was, yeah. They, they managed to salvage a 400-pound transceiver. In fact, he wasn't in contact with the submarine. He was in contact with Darwin, uh, and they were relaying messages back and forth with Darwin and the submarine, and they stayed in contact directly with the submarine um, by sending Morse code with, with torchlight from the shore. That's uh, that's just an amazing story, and uh, no uh, no doubt there's more. And and in a way, I'm I'm glad to say we're pressed for time because I wouldn't want to give it all away because I think uh, people will want to buy this book and read how it all mm. fell into place. Um, you, if you wanted to sit down, Tom, and write a work of fiction, it would be hard to come up with something this good. Mm. Yes, no, it has all of the the tenets of the, sort of a classic war story. I mean, great exhibitions of bravery and leadership and resourcefulness. Um, you know, and, and mateship as we call it down here, but also, you know, terrible violence um, and, and cruelty uh, is exhibited mm. by the Japanese occupiers is that side of the story as well. Uh, and in fact, if the man who was placed in, in command of hunting down my grandfather uh, had found him, then I wouldn't be having this conversation with you now because he mm. was the man responsible for some of the worst atrocities committed. Yeah, I'm afraid Brian would, probably would have been decapitated or worse, yeah. I suspect so. Uh, this has the makings of an amazing movie. Yeah, no, let's hope so. <laughs> uh, Tom, I congratulate you not only on the book, Rescue at 2100 Hours, I mean, hard to believe it's a true story, uh, but also how in 10 minutes you've been able to proceed that story and bring it to life for us on radio. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. You have a, a God-given gift, obviously, with words, uh, Tom, and we've enjoyed very much our chat with you, and I'd like to promote the book. It, it would make Simon a terrific Father's Day present. Oh, good in, point. In yes. only three weeks' time. It's written by Tom Trumbull. It's Rescue at 2100 Hours, and it's published by Penguin Viking. And uh, we wish you well, and uh, we salute your grandfather, Brian Rove. Thank you very much for having me. Okay.